Not in Tamworth anymore. I told you we should have taken a left. Angelina Brown tutted but said nothing as she leaned forward in the driver's seat to get a better view of the narrow road ahead. The car's windshield was dirty, the car itself in need of a good clean both inside and out, but neither her nor her husband had found the time. There had been other things to think about since the birth of their baby. She reached out automatically to turn the radio down, as though it would somehow help her to see. The signal had been cutting out anyway, turning the foundation's Build Me Up Buttercup into an experimental lo-fi synth-pop track, until it was just another layer of noise on top of her husband's complaints and the wailing infant on his lap. Tessie had thrown up twice so far, and either she'd shat herself or the fetid air from a pig farm had leaked in through the vehicle's windows. The dirt road that they were driving along was little more than a trail and looked like it had been stamped into the grass by passing cattle. Trees lined both sides of it, their branches hanging over the top and casting it into shadow. It twisted and turned like a varicose vein and was only just wide enough for the single vehicle. Angie had no idea what she'd do if they met another vehicle, though it seemed unlikely. They'd been all alone in the world for the last six miles. Are you sure we're going the right way? You heard the sat-nav, Angie said. I hate that fucking thing. Language, Angie murmured, casting an involuntary glance at the baby in her husband's lap. Tess was still screaming despite her father's best efforts, and the noise and the smell were giving Angie a headache. We can't be far off now. You said that half an hour ago. Want to swap places, Sam? No, he replied, still cradling the baby in his arms and trying to distract her by spooning slop into her mouth. Let's just hurry up and get this over with, eh? So much for baby's first road trip, Angie murmured. She was beginning to regret the whole thing. In fact, she regretted ever voicing the idea aloud. Sam had always hated Grandma Brown, and while Angie harboured no ill feelings towards the old woman, the two of them had never seen eye to eye. Angie Brown was a Protestant, and Grandma Brown had been a Catholic. And now Sam, Angie and Tess were on their way to a Catholic funeral in a little town in the home counties that none of them had ever heard of. The sat-nav sent them left, left again and then right, guiding them away from the A roads and down a B road and then what was a little more than a muddy track. Oak trees and aspens rose high above them, blocking out much of the waning sunlight. Even though it was the height of summer, the leaves had started to turn a premature brown and those that had dropped onto the track had started to rot so that the car's tyres struggled to gain purchase. Angie fought with a steering wheel and turned a deaf ear towards her husband as he muttered useless directions. They moved at a crawl, inching slowly along the track as Angie peered through the windscreen to look for approaching cars that might force them into reverse. There would be no room to pull over. There was barely enough room for them to open a door. They followed the track for several miles, switching on the headlights as the sun disappeared. The little light that was left had been blocked out by the black clouds that had drifted lazily in on the wind. By the time that they made it out of the trail, the heavens had opened and started rumbling. They found themselves pulling out onto an unpaved country road, just as a distant bolt of lightning shot down and earthed itself in the dead branches of a weeping willow. What on earth? I saw it too, Sam said unnecessarily. Tessie, still in his lap, had started crying again, and he was half-heartedly trying to fill her mouth with a pacifier. Where are we? I thought you were doing the directions, Angie replied. I was, Sam said, but the damn sat-nav doesn't have a signal. I'm not surprised. We're in the middle of nowhere. Another bolt of lightning flashed down, followed almost immediately by a louder rumble of thunder. The storm was close, rolling over their heads. The car puttered forwards another 30 metres or so, and then there was a shrill whine and the engine died. It rolled forward a little further and then slowed to a stop on the outskirts of a field of maize. Damn, Sam said. Did you forget to fill the tank? Then the car lit up with light and day turned into night as the stench of burnt ozone filled the air. There was a deathly crackle all around them as the electricity worked through the car and grounded itself in the tyres. It was over as quickly as it started and it was followed by a terse silence that was broken by a fresh wail from Tessie. What the hell is going on? Angie asked. But Sam didn't have an answer. The storm raged on and on but the car wouldn't start and neither of their phones had a signal. The sat-nav still had power, but it didn't have a signal either, and it seemed to think they were in the middle of nowhere, which they were. Tessie cried for a solid 20 minutes, then fell asleep with her thumb in her mouth. Sam got out beneath the rain and popped the hood open, but he was no mechanic and he didn't know what he was looking for, so he soon gave up and retreated to the passenger seat. Then a thick fog rolled in and surrounded the car, swaddling it in cotton wool. Visibility dropped to 20 feet, then 10, then 5 and 1. They could still hear the rain pelting down and bouncing off the roof. It was a relaxing sound, the same sound that they fell asleep to each night thanks to an app on Angie's smartphone.
It worked its magic and, with nowhere to go, no phone signal and no choice, Angie and Sam joined their daughter in Slumberland. When they awoke, the storm had passed and the fog had lifted, though it hadn't disappeared completely. Sam was the first to wake, his daughter still nestled in his arms, and he took a few moments to swim back to full consciousness before reaching over to his right and nudging his wife. She woke up much more quickly, and she was also the first to speak. The fog, she said, it's still there. I know, Sam replied, but it's starting to dissipate. And the phone? Still no signal, Sam said. Same with the sat-nav. Try the car? Angie nodded and swept her hair from her face, then twisted the key in the ignition. The engine sputtered, and for a moment it sounded as though it would catch. But then it whirred and died, and when she tried the key again, there was nothing. She swore softly, then glanced uneasily at her daughter, who was still fast asleep. Right, there's nothing for it, Sam said. I'm going to have to go and find help. From where? Angie asked. We don't know where we are. This is England, Sam replied. There must be a village or a town somewhere. A farm would do. Anywhere with a telephone. Well, okay, his wife said. But hurry back, okay? Sam nodded at her and handed her the baby, trying not to wake her. It was a lost cause from the start, and by the time that he'd extricated herself from the car and closed the door behind him, Tessie was screaming louder than the storm. He looked apologetically back at his wife, but she was too busy with the baby to notice. By the time that she looked up, he'd gone. Time rolled on, and the fog came back again and then lifted, though it still hung above them in the air. Angie could see the borders of the field that the car had slowed to a stop in, but there were no signs of humanity, and the grass grew wild and stretched towards the heavens. Her watch read 3.45pm, but it had been saying that ever since the car had broken down. Her phone had died, and so had her portable charger. But judging from the quality of the light, it was a little earlier, probably closer to noon or 1pm. That meant it had been a day since they'd left Tamworth, and they'd definitely missed the funeral. But where had the time gone? Angie dwelled on the question for the rest of the day, because she had to do something. Evening rolled around eventually, but there was still no sign of Sam. Tessie had been getting grouchier and grouchier, and Angie was out of milk and pureed vegetables. They had a rough night together, and neither of them got much sleep. The next day, the fog had lifted and the sun shone down with a vengeance, heating up the car until Angie had to first wind down the windows and then eventually open the door. The vehicle had aircon, but she still had no joy firing up the engine, and there was no sign of her husband. And so Angie caved and made a decision, changing Tessie into a final clean nappy and then wrapping her up in a sling that rested over her shoulder. Then she stepped out of the car, closed and locked the door behind her, then struck out across the field. She'd heard that in a survival situation, the best option was to follow water down river in the hope of finding a settlement. The problem was that there was no water in sight. It was just boring British fields for as far as the eye could see. She didn't even know which way was north, and so she just took a straight line in roughly the same direction that her husband had taken the day before. Angie and Tess passed through one field and then another, and the third field showed signs of life, if only because the land had been ploughed and sheaves of wheat were stretching up towards the sun. Angie felt her stomach rumble and Tess had started crying again, though she tried to pacify the child by shoving a dummy in her mouth. She pulled a couple of stalks of wheat up and sniffed at them, but she wasn't desperate enough to try eating them, especially without any water left to wash it down. At the far corner of the field, she crossed a crude wooden fence and found herself on a narrow dirt road, which had been trodden into the grass by livestock. Tess looked to her left and then her right, then withdrew a coin from her pocket and flipped it. It came up heads, and so she turned left and kept walking. The sun was higher in the sky by then, and she'd worked up a sweat that she could ill afford. She walked for another ten minutes or so, then sat herself down on a tree stump and rocked Tessie back and forth in her arms to try to lull her to sleep, though she was having none of it. On the plus side, she'd finally stopped crying and was staring out at the world through her big brown eyes. She was learning a lot. She'd never been out of the city before. Angie closed her eyes and rested for a moment, but only a couple of minutes had passed before a sound made itself known and interrupted her reverie. It was far away to begin with, but it grew slowly closer until there was no mistaking it. It was the slow and sedate clop, clop, clop of iron hooves against the dirt, accompanied by the scraping of wheels against the soil. She opened her eyes and saw an old-fashioned cart being driven towards her, with a man up front who was dressed in little more than rags. He looked like he'd never heard of bathing. Hey, she shouted, jumping to her feet and running out across the track to block its path. Wait! Whoa there. At the driver's command, the horse slowed to a stop and lowered its head nervously as its master peered out from his perch at the woman standing in front of him. Can I help you, lass? Yes, I... it's my husband, Angie said. He's called Sam and he's about six foot tall with dark hair and a five o'clock shadow. Our car broke down and our phones have no service and he... 
Whoa there, the driver said again. Your speech is too fast. Tis unusual to see such a fair lass abroad alone. I told you, my husband. I know not of what you talk, the driver said, though I fear I saw thy husband. It's fair unheard of for a stranger to visit these parts, but I spied a man like the man you speak of on the back of Tall John's dust cart. You what? Aye, the driver said. They were heading yonder, towards the village. Can you take me there? The cart driver whistled through his teeth and shot her an appraising look that seemed to linger on the baby. Your clothes, he said eventually. I've never seen their light. The feeling's mutual, Angie replied. She knew that something was wrong, but she was also a pragmatist. If a dragon had flown over the horizon, she wouldn't have protested its impossibility. She would have fled for cover. So, Angie said, how about that lift? Aye, the driver said reluctantly. Climb yourself up and I'll take you. The cart rattled as it rolled along the dirt road, but the only other sound was the chirping of the birds and the rustling of the leaves. Tessie was mercifully quiet, but the driver remained tight-lipped too, and while Angie tried a remark or two to draw him into conversation, he stayed stum. He cast an occasional glance towards her, but every time she tried to catch his eye, he turned his gaze hastily away. They travelled in silence for fifteen minutes or so before she became aware of another susurrus, something that made itself known above the wind in the trees. It was the sound of civilization, the hustle and bustle of a marketplace perhaps, and it sent a warm thrill of hope to her heart. It even overrode the confusion that had been knocking at the door of her psyche and asking to be let inside. It didn't occur to her that the most important sounds were those that were missing. The rumbling of aeroplanes overhead and the distant chugging of combustion engines. The dirt track that they'd been riding along merged slowly with a wider cobbled road and they started to pass people who were heading in the same direction. Some of them carried wicker baskets, while others smoked gnarled wooden pipes or pushed wheelbarrows. Is it market day? Angie asked. The driver grunted. The path continued to widen, and Angie noticed that several of the pedestrians had stopped to stare, with one small child pointing at her and another shouting something that she couldn't make out but which didn't sound friendly. For a brief panic second, she thought about asking the driver to take her back, but then she remembered what she was there for. She had a husband to find. And find him she did, though not in the way she'd been expecting. They passed some houses, old thatched cabins built from stone, followed by an inn with a hay-filled stable. Angie was still taking it all in when they rounded a corner and alighted on the outskirts of a town square on the other side of a grassy common. What's the date today? she asked. But the driver just looked at her and gestured for her to dismount. She did so. Tessie started crying, but the babble of voices had grown and was almost enough to block out her tears. There were other youngsters crying too, plus the braying of various animals. Drums were sounding out from the other side of the square, where a crowd had gathered. She guessed there were maybe a couple of hundred people, and the numbers were swelling with each passing moment. She turned back to look at the driver, but he'd already spurred his horses on and was making for the other side of the square. Something tells me we're not in Tamworth anymore, Tessie, she murmured. She did her best to pacify the baby, wishing that she had some milk left, and then started to rock her from side to side as she struck out across the square towards the crowd. The movement seemed to calm the child, but she could feel her own heart racing, and not just from the walk. As she got closer, she saw something that struck the fear of God into her, a sight that suggested a date if not a year. November the 5th, bonfire night. But the guy on the pyre looked familiar, and he was moving. Before she could stop herself, she was running towards the pyre while bellowing her husband's name. Sam was screaming hers right back at her, his eyes wide with horror as they focused first on her face and then on the child in the sling around her neck. Their eyes met again and he started to shout something more, but then a lit torch was laid across the kindling at his feet and the flames shot up and suddenly his cries of fear were overtaken by a rictus of pain. He hollered like a stuck pig, as though he was trying to tear the sky apart, the wail of anguish growing higher in pitch until it could only be heard by the dogs that fought each other for scraps from the butchers and ran around the pyre as though participating in some sort of sick ritualistic game. The flames shot higher and it seemed to Angie that they were drawn into her husband's lungs as he drew in one last breath to scream. She couldn't tell whether he managed it or not, because the jeers and shouts of the crowd drowned it out, and someone was banging a staccato against a drum. She tried to push forward through the crowd, but it was too thick, and Sam's head had lolled down onto his chest. He'd stopped screaming and was either unconscious or dead. She hoped for his sake that it was the latter. The smell of burnt flesh and hair turned her stomach, and for an awful moment she remembered that she still hadn't eaten. The air reeked of bacon butties, except it wasn't a pig that was on the barbecue. With Tessie still in her sling, now wailing again as though she'd understood what had happened to her father, she threw a free hand over her mouth and retched. Then she felt an arm at her elbow and what felt like a blade at her lower back. She turned her head slowly and found herself looking once again at the driver. There's another, he shouted. Devils and witches, the lot of them. They came in their metal machine. <laughs>
Kill her, someone replied. Burn her, another added. A cheer rose up in the air and the mass of people pressed in, swallowing her up as though she was a grain of sand standing against the tide. The point of the blade scored a line towards the base of her spine, but the pain barely registered. She staggered forward towards the fire. Please, she bellowed, don't do this. Burn her, she's a witch. Kill her, cast her into the flames. She begged again, but it was useless. The crowd had parted in front of her and she was pushed closer to the pyre, which was barely ten feet away and close enough for her to feel its heat. This close, she could tell that her husband was beyond help, his body moving in a rictus of spasms that no living person could ever make. She could hear the popping of his tendons as they snapped and melted away like knobs of butter on a well-done steak in a skillet. His eyes had disappeared, turned to goo or exploded from the pressure. There was another tug, this one from another direction, and she cried out in alarm as she felt Tessie being torn away from her, sling and all. She reached out desperately, but someone grabbed her arm and pinioned it behind her back. Tess, she shouted, my baby, please don't take my baby. Hush, child. The instruction came from an old crone to the other side of her. She was a sallow-faced hag with black bruises around her eyes, wrinkled skin that made her look like she'd been out in the sun for too long, and a long pointed nose that resembled a ski slope. Give the baby to me. No, I w Hush, child, the crone repeated. There's no time. Give me the baby. Angie tried to protest, but the crone had a surprisingly strong grip and the baby was already in her hands. Tessie was still crying, and the tears intensified when she was in the stranger's grip. Angie tried to grab at her, but the force of the mass crowd kept pushing her forwards, and then suddenly the baby had gone and she was five feet from the fire and with the blade still at her back. Where are you taking my baby? She screamed. But there was no response and the pyre was beckoning her on. There was a flash of lightning and a rumble of thunder, and then the heavens opened and it started to rain. The fire hissed like an angry cat but continued to burn, too wild and ferocious to be tamed by the water. A storm was on the horizon and the mist was rolling in from the hills. There had been reports of a burned out car in the countryside. Arson was low on the list of priorities for the local constabulary, which was more used to dealing with trespasses and property disputes. From time to time they were called in to help in the search for a missing tourist who'd got lost in the fields. Mostly they were there to keep up appearances and to act as a deterrent, which explained the constant debilitating budget cuts. On that particular day, the department had been busy clearing animals from the road and blocking roads that had been made impassable by fallen trees. The freak storm and the mist that had followed had caught them unawares, and they'd had to cancel leave and call for reinforcements from the city. It was the busiest they'd been since the Great Flood a decade ago. Burned out cars were a reasonably common occurrence, and they could usually be trapped back to thieves and joyriders, or occasionally to organised crime in a city. Either way, they didn't have the resources or the expertise in-house to carry out full forensics, and so that normally left them impounding what was left of the vehicle, creating a case number, assigning it to another department, and then forgetting all about it. But that day was different, and it would leave a lasting imprint on the memories of the two officers who responded to the call. They found the car on the edge of a field, shadowed beneath the eaves of the overhanging trees and covered in splashes of mud from the dirt track that led towards it. They'd had to stop twice to radio base for directions, and they still discovered it more by accident than by design. It wasn't even as though they could consult the landowner, because it still wasn't clear who the field belonged to. The car was a relatively new model, a spacious saloon car that was designed for a full family. The flames had melted away most of the paintwork, and the number plate was too charred to search for an ID, and the windows had shattered and rained down across the mud, the shards looking like a fortune in little diamonds. But it was the inside of the car that had taken the brunt of the damage, and while they'd have to wait to get some results back, the two cops immediately assumed that the fire had started on the inside of the vehicle. There were two skeletons sitting in the front of the car, charred beyond recognition. Their clothing had disappeared completely, and the fat of their skin had melted and pulled around their bony feet in the chair wells. A blackened wristwatch still hung around the passenger's arm, while the driver had lost two earrings and a necklace. They reeked of death and fire. And there was a child in the back seat, a baby. She was unharmed and sat in an untouched child seat, though she was far too small for it. They both looked as though they'd been placed in the car long after the fire had finished burning. Tessie started crying as soon as the policemen poked their heads through the windows. But this time, her mother wasn't there to calm her.